an honour to follow Earl Lytton's very wide-ranging speech, uh, and I welcome the chance to contribute to today's debate, uh, where we're asked to take note of the economy in light of the spring statement. And I believe it's important that we do take note, because with everything else that's going on and the demands on our time with respect to exiting the European Union, and we are in serious danger of missing some good economic news. Uh, and as we size up our European past, present and future, it's important we don't lose sight of our current economic position and it's not inconsiderable strengths. To name but a few, there are record numbers of people in work, household spending has never been higher, inequality is in retreat and of course the deficit is now at its lowest level since 2003. Evidence, if any more was needed, that so-called austerity need not be regressive and indeed proof that the worst thing we can do as economic stewards for the least well-off is to run high deficits. There is nothing progressive about spending more and more of our national income on debt interest instead of public services. And we, talk, we meet today when the day that Toyota has announced further investment in Derbyshire and opening of a new production line. I believe that we have more quarters of successive economic growth than any other G20 country, and unusually our FDI has actually gone up as opposed to Europe, which has gone down in the year 2018. I'm sorry about the, uh, the noble Lord uh, Macpherson of Earl's Court isn't in his usual place because I don't know whether he'd agree with me that um, there are, in fact, only two statistics which we can rely on in economic matters or fiscal matters. And these are, first, tax receipts, hard cash, which are currently at record levels. Second, economic, uh, second unemployment claimants, which, for the first time in decades, are lower than 4% which, when uh, coupled with real wage growth at 1.3%, represents good news. Critics who carp that these are lagging and not leading indicators should note that the OBR has predicted that employment is expected to rise over the next five years, with the number of people in work rising to 33.2 million by 2023. They clearly don't see a change in government on the horizon, as we know that no Labour government has left office with unemployment lower than when it started. I'd like to highlight some specific areas of note from the statement. The Chancellor continues to highlight the issue of productivity. Indeed, he refers to low wages and low productivity as the twin <coughs> demons, as he does, uh, uh, and he mentions the importance of the £37 billion National Productivity Invest Investment Fund uh, to help tackle these problems. My Lords, it's an important issue, but I still wonder whether we will ever get to the root of it until we modernise the interpretation of productivity itself. After all, services, now the mainstay of our modern economy, are, in my opinion, not properly accounted for in the productivity statistics. I've never been happy with the statistics which measure productivity's output per hour because it fails to rec recognise total output of which for, for us is very good. And, of course, given that we have full employment, we will use less productive labour, as a matter of fact. So our productivity will appear to be low, even if that's not really the case. So I would say to the Chancellor, my noble friend, the Minister, we should not allow our opponents here or abroad to criticise our productivity levels unfairly or unchallenged. It's also worth highlighting measures that recognise the importance of Britain as a trading nation, open to talent and open for business. Putting an end to landing cards, as my noble friend, the Minister, mentioned, and allowing passengers from key partner countries, particularly the United States, to use e-gates is really important and complements the new measures to support UK export finance. In particular, the general export uh, facility, which allows UK EF to support working capital requirements of exporters as companies rather than specific projects, will have a big effect. My Lords, I hope such measures are the beginning. We need to do more and communicate better the support on offer for exporters and, of course, inward investors. Like, like Lord Wakeham, I would like to refer to the papers published by the Chancellor with the Spring Statement on tax issues, particularly avoidance and evasion, which reminds us that HMRC reckon that some £900 million spent in 2010 is estimated to have brought in an additional £7 billion of revenue. And this, the report then lists some of HMRC's successes in fi fighting evasion, which I applaud. For the record, I do take issue with its definition of tax avoidance, which it, it describes as bending the rules. I don't agree with that, but I do 
uh, totally agree that contrived and artificial schemes must be and should be stamped out. Which takes me to my final and familiar subject, that of VAT and online fraud. And this spring statement gives important context with a new strategy document from HMRC. This report cites a VAT tax gap of 11.7 billion for 2016-17. And yet, UK Online Retailers Alliance suggests that the 205 million in VAT collected from overseas sellers is only 7% of what should have been collected. This suggests that current measures in place to combat fraud are not working. For example, presently, HMRC applies seller checks to overseas sellers and not UK ones. This is particularly relevant to, offline, to online sellers. And it's led to literally thousands of overseas sellers registering as UK sellers, knowing that online marketplaces do not check if the seller is actually the legal owner of that business name and associated VAT number. In other words, there is fraud going on under the noses of the likes of Amazon and eBay, and they are taking no action. Meanwhile, the Exchequer loses out on considerable revenue and genuine UK sellers are punished. Would my noble friend the Minister agree that the solution is to get these online marketplaces to take more responsibility? First, they should collect VAT themselves, and failing that, HMRC should copy the German model, whereby the sellers can't trade without a VAT compliance certificate, and that comes only after VAT returns and import invoices have been properly reviewed by HMRC. Furthermore, all anti-money laundering legislation should apply to online marketplaces so that all business details are properly displayed and verified. My Lords, HMRC's statement is to be welcomed in the round, but in this particular instance we can do more with some relatively simple interventions. I hope your Lordships will agree that it's important that the UK builds on its strong economic fundamentals, demonstrated again by this year's spring statement, with measures that support our status as a trading nation. But, as in the case of online VAT, there is also an opportunity for the UK to play a leadership role in setting out new approaches and standards for the challenges posed by a globalised, digitalised economy, and not allowing competitive pressures to be in conflict with a sense of fairness and standing up for the rule of law. My Lord, so I